what we're going to look at today is film autofocus SLRs. Now, obviously, if you watch the other videos, you've to point and shoot. We've looked at uh, mechanical and sort of like non autofocus SLRs. But as we sort of go out of the 90s, we sort of everything's becoming more technologically um, sort of you know, enhanced. We've got program modes, we've got autofocus, we've got all these things. And then obviously digital came along and, and sort of, you know, they built all these amazing cameras and just, it just sort of went, we went over to digital, didn't we? So you may have decided that, you know, you want to just get, um, you don't want to, you want to get like an autofocus camera that does what you want it to do. You want good exposure, you want automation. Um, and then maybe, you know, you want to buy some lenses or maybe those lenses, um, cause some of the EFs do obviously, the camera that you currently have, maybe you've got a Canon, um, a Canon cam, digital camera, and you've got a lot of EF lenses. You want to use those EF lenses or even old Pentax lenses on, um, you know, on a film SLR. So where do you even start with this? So that I know the original manufacturers pitched certain cameras at certain groups, but they really, nowadays, they've fallen into three key groups. Again, three groups. So you have like the ones that people don't really want or the low cost ones. You've got like the medium cameras, the medium sort of level cameras, and even the big high end ones. Now the high end ones are still very much, you know, like an F5, F6, those kind of, you know, Nikon F5, F6, that they were like their flagship cameras. There's a sort of kerfuffle in the middle with some of the cameras were sort of like aimed at pro consumers. And then you've got cameras um, that were aimed at like a lower tier of the market. But some of those, like the winds in the middle, have sort of slipped because people didn't like them, slipped down into the sort of super cheap ones. So I'll just go through those three groups. Now, each manufacturer, and I've said this in the very first video, has made a, like a starter camera, um, you know, sort of a lower tier camera for people to get going. I don't even know, this is an EOS 100. I don't even know if this was in that gra bracket. I think this was like a medium level camera, but you could pick these, all these sort of um, autofocus ones, you could pick up really cheaply, these sort of lower tier. Pentax made them, Nikon made them. They all have them out there because they're sort of sussed out that they needed to sell cameras to every demographic in the market. They couldn't, you know, like or even suss this out with their R cameras where they did cut down versions of like the R4, which became the RS, I think it was, so that they could like literally use the same production lines, but then have produced, I mean, it's how the industry works today. What do you buy? Buy a Canon R5 or do you buy the, you know, all the Canon R4 is it? I don't know. They've got this reduced structure so they can basically hit you wherever they want. But some of the ones, I think, I think the Canon 100 was a bit higher up, but realistically, I mean, there's, each manufacturer has one of these. It has everything you need on it. It'll have program modes. Some of the lower, really, like, really reduced ones, lower down, don't have as much functionality. But like this does manual, it's got modes, it's got sports mode, it's got everything. Um, and you can get them really cheaply. The only problem you've got with, obviously, these autofocus slides is the lenses. You have to buy a lens. You can't use things like Tamron adaptail lenses on them because they're autofocus. However, there are still loads of like clone autofocus lenses. And this is a Sigma, third party lenses out there that you put on these cameras. The thing with this is it literally looks like, it's like a giant point and shoot, isn't it? You can go out for the day, the exposure system's much better. You do, can, you can step in and you can change things, change all the settings on these and take great photos. So that's the sort of base, base tier model. I mean, you can get some of these cameras, that I'm not joking, 30, 40 quid, things like that, but you need the lens, you need to add the cost of the lens on. But it's a, they're really good because you can really sort of like get to grips with photography on these cameras. I mean, this one, it's got that marking on it because it ha I actually got it from like a job lot that came from a photography department at some university or college. They'd switched to digital and they just sold off a load of these. So, I mean, it's like you can pick up some of the bargains with these. Everything can go wrong on them, obviously. Foam mirrors, foam normally deteriorates. The, the seals deteriorate, all sorts can go wrong with them. So there's a risk, obviously, you know, much bigger risk with these things than some of the earlier cameras, like, you know, the mechanicals, because it's electronic. And when electronics go, they're gone. Unless it's sort of broken track, 
or, or something to come a wise moment if a component goes on these it's very hard to get them fixed so that's the that's the lower tier um, autofocus cameras let's have a look at the medium tier okay so this is i know it's a white one but it, this is a Dynax 8000i. This was like Minolta's medium level um, sort of autofocus camera, but each manufacturer had one of these. It had a little bit more. There's a good thing on Wikipedia, actually. If you look at each major camera manufacturer, they have a, a chart on Wikipedia that shows you where the camera sat. Like they have the top line for the flagships and they have where it was sort of targeted originally. But still, there's some real bargains that you have with these. And these are cr incredibly capable cameras. Um, you know, you but again, you know, more technology, more things can go wrong. So you've got the Minotas, you know, the, all the manufacturers have this medium band. But again, it's sort of like, you know, where do you want to jump in? Do you want to spend, I don't know, 30, 40 quid on these? These are probably like 100 pounds or something. But mind you, some of these could be even cheaper. And, you know, but you get immensely capable camera. You have to watch out, like, this one here has a flash built in. I don't think I can open it without power. Yeah, has a flash built in. Some of the ones that, you know, it was a big thing, but if you had a professional camera, it didn't have the flash built in. But obviously, it's like this, doesn't have a flash built in. And they wanted you to buy the flash unit for it because it made it, you know, like a professional camera. But we'll come to that in a minute because a lot of manufacturers just ignored that and built flashes in. And they still are their top range professional cameras. So yeah, so the medium cameras, um, yeah, you've got a lot more functionality. You've got add-ons like the Dynax system here had like a card system to add extra functionality onto the back of the camera. There it is. Um, goes in there. You can do all sorts with it. You can adjust your ISO. You know, you can do everything you want to it. There's no limitations to how you can control the film going through it. And it had better autofocus, better metering. So yeah, so that's the middle tier. And there's tons of these around. But obviously what people do, they get really seduced by the next one up. They want the better camera and they sort of skip these. I mean, a lot of the Minolta's I've bought, I've got for like next to nothing and they're really good cameras. And it's interesting, Minolta were the people that first bought um, autofocus to market properly in the earlier versions of these. So yeah, so there's plenty to choose from. Again, do your search. If you've got a digital camera now, like a Canon with EF lenses, then there's potentially mo you know, most of the Canons will work with the EF lenses. Minolta's line's dead. Um, it became Minolta A mount for Sony and then Sony changed mount. So, you know, that you won't, there's no way forward with the glass on Minolta. Uh, Nikon, most of the Nikon glass still works. Um, yeah, and the Pentax glass still works. And back in the day, I know that the, the Canon and Nikon have now changed the mounts. So you could get an adapter, but I'm not sure if the RF adapter works with the F lenses, the old EF lenses, possibly does. Anyway, so there's lots of options with that and you can get some great bargains with these ones. What's the flagship? Uh, this is a Minolta Dynax 9. This was the monster flagship camera of the Minolta range. I think the last big flagship they made before they they either got consumed by Sony or whatever happened to them. But these are the ones to be aware of. I mean, they're nice to think about buying one of these because it's got all the toys. It's built you know, the big ones like F6s and F5s. And then you've got which Canons, the EOS 1s. Yeah, the big Canons as well. They all have their very serious professional autofocus camera. The problem being with these is, and if you're like new to this, they weigh, they're like bricks. They're very, very heavy normally. They're like built, they are robust, but they're built to take a beating because they're used by the press a lot. They're heavy, they're not, um, you know, um, they're not the, the most gentle things to carry around, you know what I mean? They're, they're quite heavy cameras. They've got tons of features, and obviously they've got tons that can go wrong, but a lot of them, like Minolta and I, they're built, they're very robust cameras. All of them, if you have to do a bit of research, you know, you can see which ones have major weaknesses. Um, I think the Minolta had something to do with the, there was a problem with the aperture ring on here on certain certain versions of it. But these get to be really expensive. They're, you're into the like three, four, five hundred, six hundred pounds for some of them. Some of the earlier heavyweight cameras like the F4, 
I think, and he, you can pick up for less, but those things are giants and they take massive batteries. And I mean, you have to be quite committed to take one of these things out for the day because they weigh a lot of money. They weigh a lot of, um, they, they weigh a lot. So yeah, so I mean, you know, Nikon, there was always a tear down. It's like, there was a seven for, for Minolta, they did like a step down. Nikon did like the F100s. So there was, they did like a little bit back from the big one. But yeah, if you're gonna get, I wouldn't get one of these, first of all. I really would like get something like that to play with and see what you want. And if you can get your hands on one to try it out, because I don't think people really appreciate the weight of some of these cameras until you get them, because it can be really heavy. And the moment you put a zoom on the front of this, it like doubles its weight. So, you know, think really carefully about these as well, because obviously they break these, these ones like this broke. I don't know where we'd get it fixed, if it was fixable at all. Um, and that's the other problem. Then Nikon, maybe a Nikon, there are some Nikon people out there. I'm not sure about camera because it's all down to like ICUs now, isn't it? It's like CPUs and chips. So if anything gets fried like that, you, you know, you, you, you're lost it. So yeah, so that's the three big groups of the autofocus film cameras. Now, as I've stated in the other video, buying these things, you've got eBay, um, you've got to ask all the appropriate questions of the, the buyer. Does it work? Have you tested it with film? Um, all these kind of things um, on eBay. There's some great shops. I'll put those in the comments below that you can buy these cameras from. Um, and they've got them with warranties, which is brilliant. Uh, because obviously if they do break within the 12 months, they either refund you the money if they can't fix it, or they, um, or they fix it for you. But I, you know, it comes to the autofocus ones. I mean, the, the reason a lot of people get an autofocus one is to match up with, uh, like they're shooting a, you know, like a, a, a Canon camera and they just want to shoot some film with it as well. There's some great ones out there to do it. But yeah, as I said in the previous video, do loads of research, look at the serial number to try and get a later model, all this kind of business. It's not so bad with those cameras, with the serial numbers and stuff. It was more applied to the um, more mechanical, non autofocus SLRs. But it is a problem. I mean, you know, when one of those dies, they really die. Um, and there's not much coming back. So you've got to consider it as an investment uh, and make sure you buy it from the most reputable place. So if it dies within that 12 month window, you can get your 300, 400 quid back. I mean, I think the nines are 300 pounds. So it's a you know, sizable chunk of money. But yeah, so, you know, they're great fun, those ones. I mean, you know, they're more akin to what you're shooting now if you're shooting digital. Um, they're great because of the autofocus and stuff like that. You, you're probably gonna get, you know, film's expensive, so you don't wanna waste it by mucking around with cameras that, you know, if you don't really understand it, where you've got wrong metering, all these kind of things. So yeah, so, you know, I hope that's helpful. I'll put some links in the comments section and, and you can go off and buy yourself a fully automated all guns blazing film SLR and, and then shoot like, you know, that beginning was it the Duran Duran song, Girls on Film, let the, the shutter fly there. Anyway, hope that's you. Thanks for watching.